you say? Three hours? Yeah. Possibly four. Um, so probably three hours. What I've got on there is don't estimate the average. And that's kind of what you were all doing. Because what we tend to do, we tend to quote the average for things, don't we? Three hours is probably the average to get there. Um, by the way, how quickly could you get there if you really were very lucky and every traffic light was green and you were just going for it with badges bouncing off your bonnet? Two and a half? I reckon I could do it quicker than that, actually. I I've done it in two and a half in my Clio. In your Clio? Yeah. So, um, yeah, OK, well, we'll go for two and a half. So, when someone says how long does it take, you could quote the average. What's wrong with quoting the average, by the way? It could be more or less. And what's the probability that I'll be late? If I say, I'll see you in Birmingham in three hours, what's the probability I'll be late, average? It's going to be 50%, isn't it? And so I know it averages out, and some are more and some are less, but the problem with projects is I can't go, sorry, your project was late, Eric, but Simon's was early, um, because that doesn't make you feel any happier. You're probably less happy that he got his. So, so what will happen is that you'll, you'll fail on half your projects, and half your customers will be unhappy. So, quoting the average is no good, but it's definitely worse to quote the best. I'm wondering whether that's going to come up. Oh, look, I've got a graph here. Yeah. Um, right. Because um, if, if you quote the best, then what's the probability you're going to be late? If I said I'll see you in two and a half hours and I'm going in a Clio, what, what's the chance I'm going to be late? Yeah, 90%. So you would be mad to quote the best time, wouldn't you? But people do. Because what happens is, the boss or customer says, if it all goes really well and there aren't any problems and the IT works first time, etc., etc., how quickly might you be able to do it? And like a fool, you tell them the truth and you say, well, I might be able to do it in two and a half if everything goes really well. And what do they hear? Two and a half. So you're now doomed. So what must we say? If they say what's the best you could possibly do, you need to weasel out. And you need to say, well, tricky, because quite a lot of things could be delays at Andover. You know, the, the Andover? <laughs> That's my special shortcut. <laughs> or whatever. And the IT might not work or whatever. Um, and so, you know, it could easily take four, is what you must do. You must weasel out. Don't answer the question if they ask for the best time. Because once you've said the number two and a half, that number is out of the bottle and you never get it back in. Now, we could... Sorry, yes. If you're tendering, yeah. It could be a bit too generous and then somebody else suggests it. Yes. Um, absolutely. And, and what we're doing here is we're, we're first of all thinking about what the real answer is. And then after that, you've got the question of what do you tell the customer. And you might decide to quote the two and a half just to get the work and then let them down later. Which I think would be a bad idea. <laughs> but there are people who do that. Um, and it depends on how bad it is if you let them down. So you could quote the average to get the work. But if there are sort of penalty clauses and it's going to be a total nightmare, um, it might be better to quote them something realistic. And if you don't get the work, maybe you didn't even want the work. Um, and of course, then there's the other thing is there's the long game of gradually building up a reputation for delivering. Um, and so there are some people who do that. And they actually really do. They put a safety margin in, and they always do deliver. But then they lose some work to some customers. Um, and then that's the horrible game of tendering. But that's kind of the problem with tendering, because it means that customers in the end will get promises that, um, that won't be kept. And is that what you want? Yeah. So... Yeah. Hopefully. If there was justice, that's what would happen. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, obviously... Um, how long, how long might it take, it, might it take in, in the worst case, how long would it take us to get to Birmingham if everything's against us? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is the worst case where you break down and while you're trying to repair your car, you get attacked and you have to run off into the woods um, and then you're found six weeks later having lived off raw rabbit with a big beard wearing only your pants or something like that. <laughs> but, but leaving aside the really, really unlikely scenarios... Sorry, we'll edit that bit out of the video later. But, but um, leaving it, that aside... Um, what, what should we say would be, you know, a typically kind of bad journey? Five say five hours? Yeah. Now, let's say five. So, we've got everything from two and a half to five, and suppose I recorded all my journeys to Birmingham in a little book, The Journey Times. Do you think I would do that, by the way? Yes. No, I would not. <laughs> uh, I did used to, but I'm better now. <laughs> but anyway, 
Um, and suppose I fed all those journey times into an Excel spreadsheet. I could get a graph like this, couldn't I? Are you happy with the fact it'll be something like that? Because most of them will be in the middle, won't they, around the sort of three-ish. Occasionally you get a really lucky two and a half. And occasionally you get the nightmare five hours. And obviously this tale does go on forever with the raw rabbit scenario sort of there. But leaving aside that. So you've got kind of two and a half to five. Um, with, with three in the middle. Three, of course, isn't the middle number, is it? Because it's actually skewed. Because it's much harder for things to be quicker than you thought. And it's much easier for them, them to take longer than you thought. And that's one of the unfairnesses of project management. It's asymmetrical. Because if you think about it, how are you going to get there quicker than your plan? Am I likely to discover a big new motorway through Andover that I didn't know existed? Pretty unlikely. Um, and in fact, if there was a fantastic new motorway, that would be my plan. So your plan is usually to do it the best way. But there are loads of ways to do it worse than your plan. You know, all you need is the road closed or a problem with your car or whatever, and then it's taken longer. So with any project, there'll be lots of ways for it to be worse and not really any ways for it to be better. If you think about the listing of the tasks we talked about just now, it's really easy to forget some tasks. But it's pretty unlikely you're going to remember a task you don't have to do. You know, I finished the house early because we didn't have to do the walls after all. It was really great, finished early. That's not going to happen. So, so therefore, you know, people talk about sod's law and the devil runs the world. It isn't that. It's just that if there was a better plan, that would be your plan. So, so we need to put some safety margin in. And so thinking about these, these three numbers we've got of two and a half, three and five, what number do you suppose we should quote the customer? Because we probably can't get away with five. But if we say three, then it's going to be 50-50 chance about whether we deliver, which is not really a good enough hit rate. And the answer is to go halfway between the average and the worst, halfway between the three and the five. So if you quote about four, by the way, I wouldn't quote four. I'd probably quote something like four hours and seven minutes. Why would I do that? Yeah, sounds more scientific, yeah. Because <laughs> otherwise it would sound like you just made it up. Whenever I do a quote question, I say, you, you wouldn't put 20,000 pounds on a loan. You know, you think yes, hours, yes. You've got to put 20,000 pounds on a loan. 20,000 Yes. I know somebody who puts the date on the end as pence. So what, is it the 11th today? The 13th. The 13th. I'm only two days behind. So you'd put, and 13p, which has the extra advantage of you know when you wrote the quote. But, but I just think that's, that's kind of crazy but fun. Plus, he gets an extra 13p. Or, or even possibly another 31p if it's a lucky month. Or if you're more clever, you take 13p off. So you just Yeah, which would sound good. Yeah. Mm. Quick, make a note, everyone. I like that. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, the point is you'd put about four hours. And there's lots of maths involved, and we won't worry about that. But basically, if you have a line about here, then this bit is about 10% of the total area. Do you think it is? Say yes. It is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so that will mean that you'll be about 90% safe, because these are my journeys that took more than four hours. So, so if you quote halfway between the average and the worst, you'll you'll be okay for nine projects out of ten, which is a pretty good success rate. You're still going to fail on one in ten. You have to live with that. It's just how it is. The only way you can never fail is to go around quoting ridiculous amounts, which, you know, even if you're not tendering, it's just not, not a good idea to quote ridiculous amounts. So there's a bit about estimating. It's a, <laughs> it's a probab probability game, really. But my tip four is don't quote the average. And that's one of those simple things that once you've seen it, it's obvious. But before you've seen it, it isn't, I think. Well, that works well for time. What about cost? It, yeah, I'm glad you said that, actually, because I forgot to say that it's exactly the same for both. Yeah. So, so if I'm thinking, you know, what's the cost of doing a job, and, it's, and it might be 25 grand, but it'd probably be 30, but it could be as much as 50, you need to quote 40. And what people normally do is they add 10% on. So if they think it's 30, they'll add another 3. But what I'm saying is adding 3 is not enough. You, add, you need to add 10 on if you're going to be reasonably safe. Because that's the width of the spread. I mean, you can see the probability curve. Someone so said that any project, um, the costs are 20% higher than the other say, and the benefits are 20% less. Yes. So that's probably a 40% gap, which is kind of not far off what I'm saying. Yeah. Because there are just so many unknowns. 
it's the most difficult thing, really, project management, because you go into the unknown. But it's much more fun than processes, because processes are relatively boring, aren't they? Because they're just the same every day. Whereas projects, you're doing new things every time, much more fun. Right, um, so yeah, so we want to go halfway, if we can. Um, step five, as illustrated by these people here, look at all her jewellery and nail varnish. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, these people actually are from Bournemouth Council. Well, that's the last Bournemouth Council ever do project manager. So um, you may recognise them. There they are. They're from Bournemouth Council. And yes, Bournemouth Council does do project management because I've the been surf teaching reef. them it for... Uh, probably the surf reef, yeah. I think they look like surfers, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> One of them's from the payroll department, actually, but I'm not quite sure about the others. Um, but what they're doing there is they're doing the post-it note thing. And this is, I think, actually, if you do one thing from this whole talk, it's this, which is write each task on a post-it note and move them around on a piece of paper until you've got them in order, until you get a diagram like that kind of thing. Now, you can see that. That's my dream. My dream is post-it notes on a whiteboard. <laughs> Ooh, that's the best of all. Because then you can rub out the lines and you can move them and it's marvellous. Second best, if you don't have access to a whiteboard, is post-its on a piece of paper, which is still pretty good, but you have to use a pencil and rub out the arrows. Third best is a whiteboard but no post-its. I suspect, actually, Bournemouth Council, they're on such hard times now, they're probably nearing the moment of post-it note ban. But that's just a really bad idea, because you could have a million quid project going to go horribly wrong, because you didn't spend 20p on some post-its. So, personally, I think they're a good investment. But, but my third option, if you don't have post-its, would be just a whiteboard and lots of rubbing out. My fourth option, if you don't have a whiteboard or post-its, and that's the NHS, would, would probably be just a big bit of paper and lots of rubbing out. And my fifth option <laughs> would be a computer. I just don't think a computer's right for, for the post-it note thing, because really you want to have a group of people, you want to just be able to move stuff around and think, and you don't want a computer that's going to argue with you and crash and do all the stuff that computers do, and the screen's too small and all that. So we're going to come to computers in a minute, but for this step, much better just have some post-its and move them around. And so all we're doing in this diagram, it's just a flow diagram from left to right, really. Uh, just get them in order and work out what depends on what. So you can see that before they can do this bit, they have to do all of these different branches. It all comes together there. Um, so there's a sort of start there. I don't know if a post-it's dropped off, actually. It looks like it has. Um, and that's the running order of the tasks. And then they've put the estimated times on them. You could actually do your estimating after you've done your post-it note diagram. It doesn't really matter. But at some point, you need to put on... Um, what, what those um, elapsed times are going to be. So when it says two weeks, that may not be two weeks of solid work, but that's how long you think it's going to take to get that job done, bearing in mind that some people won't be around and you know, you'll be doing other work and things. So you put the elapsed time on each post-it note. And there are really two purposes for doing this. Um, one of them is just to decide on the running order and to make sure you've thought about what depends on what. The other purpose is to get the longest path. And this particular one, the longest path, oof, I think it actually goes there and then up through there, probably, and then down along there. But it might go, oh, no, it doesn't. It goes through here, doesn't it? In fact, you can see they've marked it in red. So the longest path goes through there. And what's the posh name for the longest path? It's the critical path, yep. It's known as the critical path. I think originally it used to be called the time critical path because we're only looking at time. We're not saying that the quality is difficult or important. We're not saying they're expensive. We're just saying that those are the slowest tasks and they're the ones that are going to affect how long it takes to get the job done. So the objective of this diagram is to find the critical path and you never really know where it's going to be till you've done the diagram. How long do you think it would take to do that? You know, half an hour maybe? For a project that you knew about. Just write out the post-its, move them around. That's really half an hour well spent. There's one other advantage of this, which is that when, you're, when you've got a big, horrible task to do and you just can't face it, you think, oh, how do we even start on that? If you do one of these diagrams, it then tells you that that's where you start. Well, in fact, this one, this one, and this one are the things you can start straight away, and that one. So it's a really good way to help yourself get started on something that's just horrendous. Because your mind can't cope with that. But once you've drawn it out, you think, well, actually, it's not that bad. At least I can get started there. So the post-it note diagram is a brilliant thing. 
It's got various posh names like a critical path diagram or a network diagram. Sometimes they're called a PERT chart as well. Project managers have no sense of humour. They don't find the word PERT at all funny. 